Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's ArcGIS for Local Government Meetup. I'm Allison Mews, and I'm going to be hosting today. And Scott Ottman and Walter Potts are going to be presenting what's new in ArcGIS for Local Government. Um, we have a lot of content to present today. We may actually go over the one hour that we've set aside for this. Um, if you have to drop off early, don't worry. We are recording this meetup, and you'll be able to watch it online. Um, Later, just give us a day or two to get it posted, and we'll send out a message once that's available. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Scott to get started on what we've been up to and what we've got planned. OK. Thanks, Allison. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can hear you. OK, great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Hope everyone had a good holiday season and is kicking off 2016 with a bang. Um, Walt and I wanted to take a few minutes today, as Allison said, to really share with you a couple things. One. Um, what we shipped in the December release, the 2015 release, the last tw release of 2015, and what we've got planned for 2016. And, and before we do that, though, we really wanted to just stop for a minute and thank you for a great year. Um, we, as a community, we crossed the 500,000 download mark, which is a pretty large number. So it's just great to see all the folks who are grabbing the content we're making available to the community download and give us feedback. Uh, the meetup community as a whole has more than 1,200 members now. Um, and we've seen over 10,000 ArcGIS Online apps configured um, you know, from the web application templates provided. And not only are we um, seeing great participation and uh, activity on the meetups, um, but we also had a real, turn, a real large turnout at the UC and the meetups we had there um, and other events where we've been connecting directly with users. And so I just want to thank everyone for all the feedback they provide uh, throughout the year. And really, your participation in this community drives the content for everyone. And, and I just want to take a minute to thank you for that. So today, we're going to focus, as I mentioned, on two key things. One is you know, we shipped our last uh, release in 2015 right before Christmas. And many of you were probably heading out for the holidays. And so we wanted to take a few minutes to just give you an overview of what was included in that December release and then spend the bulk of our time really talking about the road ahead in 2016 or our product, product roadmap. And you'll see today we've got two primary releases between now and the user conference in June. And then we've got a lot of ideas for future work kind of post UC. And one of the key things I'd like to get out of today is really to get you guys thinking about priorities and what's important. And you'll see as we start to articulate some ideas we have for future work in 2016, it's really important to us that you guys tell us what's, what you think will be valuable to you. And so you know, as we're going along today, you know, feel free to stop us and ask questions. We definitely have time for questions, and we want to take those questions. And we also want you guys to be thinking about how you can uh, influence what we're doing in the future. And so uh, really, today's the start of that conversation. And then you know, we'll provide a whole variety of ways on the meetup and when we connect up with you guys directly to, to influence that more. So let's just kick this whole thing off and just start with a quick recap of our uh, December release. And if I were to summarize the work we did, there was kind of four or five key areas that we worked on in December. Um, we had some updates to the problem reporter solution, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, we had our first 3D scene, our 3D solution offering. And Gert, a member of our team, um, has been working actively to deliver a new 3D offerings for you. And this spring, we'll actually do a whole meetup on the new 3D content we've been developing. Uh, we rounded out the elections maps and apps, and we'll talk more about that today. And Walt, who works um, predominantly with the public safety community, also delivered some new content for the fire service community. So that's really the new content we shipped that we'll spend a few minutes talking about today. And I'll also point out that there's a whole variety of other miscellaneous updates we did to toolboxes and and several of the applications and uh, just kind of miscellaneous updates uh, that based on the feedback you guys were giving us. But let's just drill in and start to look at a few of these enhancements that we provided and new, new content we provide. And I'm going to start with the citizen problem reporter solution. So if you're not familiar with this solution, essentially you can think of it as a 311 or a citizen service request application for your community. And it, it's actually leveraging the crowdsource reporter and crowdsource manager solution offerings. And we shipped the first version of that uh, back in July of last year. And there were two primary updates or two primary pieces of feedback that we heard from users as they started to kind of configure that for their organization. The first was, how do I monitor the reports that are coming in? 
And second, I want to actually configure real-time notifications. So when a problem is reported of maybe a specific type, it can be an email can be sent to maybe the planning department or the code enforcement folks to do that. Um, so let me jump out here uh, to and just show you guys what some of those enhancements look like. And I'm going to start with the citizen problem reporter uh, and kind of help topic on the landing page there and highlight a few of these key enhancements. So now when you come to the main landing page for the problem reporter solution, what you'll find is we actually have three try it live experiences you can use to kind of understand how this solution can be leveraged in your organization. We actually have a problem reporter application, which the general public would use to submit requests for service. We have the problem manager or, or problem management application, which can be used by folks inside your organization to triage those problems and assign them to the appropriate party. And we have a new dashboard that you can use to really monitor um, the problems as they are being reported. And so this is a configuration of the operations dashboard for ArcGIS. And essentially what it has is a list of problems that are being reported. And you can see some key information about it of when they're reported and where they're located. I can see the problems by type. And I can see at any point in time the total number of issues. And the dashboard's really organized around problem types. So you can see these are blight issues in the community that are being reported. If I slide that panel over, I can now look at road problems that have been reported. And ultimately, uh, the last configuration we provided was utility and sewer problems. And so it's a real quick, simple way for you to configure um, the operations dashboard for ArcGIS to really help round out those problem reporting workflows in your community. And then the last thing I'll show you is that if you dig into the Get Started topics, you'll see that we added a new help topic to help you guys set up and configure those real-time problem notifications. Um, so what this is is a configuration of ArcGIS GeoEvent extension for server. And it allows you to define uh, essentially inputs, which may represent problems that our people are reporting, and ultimately set up a set of output connectors that uh, can be used to send emails to specific recipients in your organization. And so this workflow here will actually help you take GeoEvent extension and configure it with your uh, service request layers or your problem report layers um, to do that notification. And you could configure this in a variety of ways. It could be configured in one situation to send emails to folks inside your organization. Another configuration could be that when the problem's reported, you could send an email back to the citizen that says, thank you very much. We've gotten your, uh, your service request, and we'll be handling it as quickly as possible. And so there's a whole variety of, you can be, variety of ways you can begin to leverage this configuration in your organization. So that's a quick overview of some of the enhancements that we made to Citizen Problem Reporter. Um, and we're going to continue to enhance um, the, you know, these workflows and round it out with uh, additional aspects of ArcGIS. Um, you know, you know, many of you may have heard that Workforce, which is a new application that's available with ArcGIS, is now in beta. And we're going to start to look at how Workforce could be, um, you know, could extend the kind of problem reporting workflows and essentially allow folks you to take problems as they're reported by citizens, queue them up for maybe your uh, inspectors in your code, code compliance office, and then uh, route them to the appropriate problems and maybe even do, a, uh, you know, start a code violation complaint. Um, if they find that there is a problem, in fact, in that community. So, so we'll continue to enhance this going forward. Um, just touch real briefly on this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time today on the 3D stuff we uh, first released. But as I mentioned, Gert's been working on a whole set of 3D solution offerings for the local government community. And our first uh, release includes the ability for you guys to build what we call a basic scene um, from your 2D GIS content. So essentially, this uses uh, elevation data that you have in your community, building footprint information in trees you have for your community to produce a, a LOD1 or a simple uh, level of display 1 3D mass model for your community. And we're going to continue to enhance these 3D offerings. And we'll be adding new content in subsequent releases, which we'll talk about today. And in the spring, we'll spend more time drilling deeper into the 3D solutions in one of our meetups. Um, but we're definitely beginning to look at 3D and 3D offerings uh, that we'll add to the local government solution this spring. Uh, before I turn it over to Walt, let me just summarize with the work we've done um, in December for elections. Um, as you know, last fall we started a complete uh, 
uh, set of updates for all of our election solutions. And I think it was October we shipped the election polling places solution and the early voting solution as well as a new My Elected Representative solution. Well, in December we finished um, we finished rounding out those election solutions by providing a whole new election results application that you can configure in your organization. And we actually took the feedback that we got at the, I think it was a November meetup, uh, one of the pieces of feedback that you guys had is that you were trying to figure out how you could track polling place wait times um, and report those wait times to citizens or voters on election day. And so we actually um, developed a configuration of collector for ArcGIS to do that exact thing. And so there's a real good example of the feedback you guys gave us. We, we took a quick look at how we could uh, you know, kind of solve the problems and challenges you gave us and delivered a new solution in December to, to, to address that. Um, so let me jump out here and show you what some of that election stuff looks like. Um, I'm going to start with the election uh, result solution. Um, so this is, uh, much like the other election solutions we delivered last fall, a configuration of Web App Builder. Um, and right now it's currently in the developer edition only, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But what it includes is a theme to help you style the application and a new widget that we call related table charts that helps you chart actual election results. Um, so as a citizen on election night, I can come in and I can you know, either search for my address or just simply poke on my precinct on the map. And what it's going to do is um, identify that precinct and essentially present to me all the election results for different political contests you guys would like to share with your community. Um, so here's you know, presidential results. Um, U.S. House of Representatives, and obviously I can go all the way down into local uh, results as well, too. In addition, I also have the ability, much like you had in the previous um, election results solution, to actually begin to look at voter turnout. Um, and so I can chart actual results in bars and columns or voter turnout um, as a pie chart as well, too. Um, so this new solution um, you know, provides the Web App Builder configuration and additional widgets you need to do that charting. Uh, we've also updated all of the publishing scripts that help you take the election results from your tabulation systems and push them either to your ArcGIS uh, online organization or to your ArcGIS server implementation. Um, and then ultimately, you can quickly wire up the maps um, to, um, you know, to either at the precinct level or some other geography. And I know that was one of the key limitations we had in the previous application. So I wanted to show you um, just to kind of highlight how flexible this new solution is. Here's the exact same solution configured for a state. Um, so this is the state of Illinois. And instead of aggregating those election results by precinct, they're actually um, aggregated by county in this case. And so I just tapped on DuPage County, which is where Naperville is located. Um, and you can see now that I'm looking at all of the results for the entire county. Um, and that may be done at a state level or you may choose to do this in your county for the entire political or election geography, maybe for a state rep or for other um, county commissioners. And so I can quickly see, you know, very much kind of the same information, but now for statewide offices um, and look at, you know, how that, that, that county voted in its entirety for that. Um, so it's a very flexible implementation. You guys can kind of pick the geography you want to report the results on and then configure the application for, for that. Um, the last thing I want to show you is, um, as I mentioned, we also uh, developed a collector configuration that can be used by polling workers um, to report wait times. And not only did we uh, you know, provide that collector configuration, which I'm not going to really show you the collector configuration. Instead, what I'm going to show you is kind of how that collector configuration and that content now can be represented whoops, um, uh, in the polling place application or maybe on a public website. Uh, public map on your website. And so you can see I just quickly clicked on that individual uh, polling place, and now I can embed in the pop-up what the wait time is. So if I'm a citizen um, in my community and I just want to quickly, I'm not going to enter an address, I'm just going to tap on a location, it's going to tell me where I vote. And in addition to giving me basic information about the polling place and voting information that day, um, it's going to give me the wait times that are being reported in real time by folks in your uh, that, that are working the polls. And so it's a real nice way for you guys to kind of share that information with citizens in your community as well, too. 
So that's the enhancements we provided for elections. Um, and what I'll do now, um, Allison, give us two more minutes, and then we can take questions. We're definitely going to take a break in a minute, um, and we can take questions. But so I see some of them are starting to come in. Yeah, um, if anybody has any and questions, me, you can post them in that chat window. Yeah. I'll, so let me just turn it over now to Walt and um, let him talk a little bit about fire incident maps, and then we can um, take some questions, as I said. All right, Perfect. Walt, Thank I'm going to give you yeah. control. Go ahead, you're taking right. it, I think. Good. You guys see my screen okay? Yep. Good. Uh, thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm glad to be with you this afternoon. Um, yeah, some some things that we've been working on that we'd like to share a little bit with you that we released back in December. Uh, this one here that you're looking at is the fire incident maps. Uh, for those of you that may be familiar, this is a configuration of the public safety incident maps that was released the prior year. And this one is for fire service. So let me give you the overview of what it is. It's a, it's a solution that allows the fire department's command staff to be able to look at uh, incidents that have come in over the last some period of time, you know, seven days, 30 days, or something like that, um, and see how they, uh, what kind of incidents we have, and so on, make some decisions with it. And just to start off, I'm just going to show you what it looks like, and then I'll explain how you use it. Uh, but a couple things is uh, it allows you to pull in incidents from a file, like a CSV file or a spreadsheet that comes out of your records management system and then be able to import them into ArcGIS and then publish them either to ArcGIS for Server or ArcGIS Online. In this Try It Live example that you're seeing here, these are fire incident maps that have been published to ArcGIS Online. So this is showing us four different ways of looking at the same information that's been pulled in from that file. And this is a file of incidents. This is over a 30-day period. In this case here, we're looking at the incidents by cost. So we have an attribute in that file that came out of our records management system that indicates what the cause was. And we, we also have updated symbology for it, so we can look at see what kind of uh, incidents that we have in this particular area here, or zoom in and out, and so on. So we have an uh, electronic map of that information that's coming out of that spreadsheet. But another way we can look at it, if we go back to the gallery in the Try It Live, is we can look at it by the incident type. Again, we have an attribute in the file that came out of a records management system. In this case, it just happens to be type, and it tells us uh, how they are coded according to the NIFRS, if you're familiar with that format. Uh, it's a standard and allows us to be able to display that based on that code that came in from the call. And so we can take a look at it. Same thing, we have pop-up, gives information about how that, uh, what information was on that particular call. It's the same location you saw before, it's just symbolized in a different way. A third way to look at it is the responding company. What unit responded to that particular incident? I'm going to zoom into that same area and just go over to there and see, you can see that we have a lot of medical calls that uh, Unit 7 responded to and Engine 7 and so on in this particular area. Uh, so it just allows us to look at the same information in multiple different ways. The fourth uh, method of looking at the information or way to look at the information is by the response times of that responding company. So how long did it take them to respond and it's broken down by the, the number here again that was recorded in the records management system and then uh, was leveraged into this application. So the way the application works, so I can just go back here a little bit and show you. Uh, we, you just saw is the try it live for this particular application for the fire incident maps. And as it says here, it's just a way for um, commanders, operators, uh, operation staff to be able to view that incident information in those four different ways. And it includes some scripts. I'm just going to show you how you can, the documentation for some of these scripts. You get in here, they get started. And it includes scripts. Uh, that allow you to be able to configure how you want to bring in those incidents. So it allows you to tell it where the incidents are coming from, where you want them to go to, you know, what kind of a directory you want them to go into, um, how you're going to identify them, and so on. You can do some things like I can uh, publish them uh, to RTS Online or to server or not publish them at all. I can do address locations. If I have X and Y in my records management system, I can use that, or it'll geocode them based on the address, and I can set up whatever geocoder I want for that. In this case, I've just used a, a composite geocoder. Um, and there's some other information that you can uh, add to it. So all this stuff can be stored in a configuration file as displayed here in the documentation. Once that configuration file is set up, it could be run on a regular basis. Like, let's say you want to know every 30 days what kind of incidents are coming in so that you can map them out and give them to your command staff, and then they can access them in the applications that I was sharing with you. So one way you can do that is you can set that 
that script up to read that configuration file and put it in Windows Task Scheduler as documented here. And so it's just automatically going to look for that file, grab those incidents, geocodes them, brings them into ArcGIS on, Online or wherever you publish them to, and publishes them out into a feature service. And that'll happen on the regular schedule. So if I have it at 30 days, and I set up the trigger to run that way, every 30 days then I'm going to get an update to these layers. So then I can see the status of uh, the changes that have happened. And we can kind of monitor things as they go over time. It also includes some information, documentation about how you can set these up. Uh, that's also in the in the uh, scripts here, and the in the documentation I should say for the scripts. Um, so if you wanted to go in here and set up some workflows, you could do that. Perhaps you wanted to do it in a different way that we don't have on here. The key is that there just has to be an attribute for each one of those uh, maps. But the idea is that it brings the script can run automatically, brings in that data for you, publishes it in multiple different ways using the same feature service, and then update it, updates it on a periodic basis to make it easy for you to manage. So it takes, takes the pressure off the GIS manager to support those requests that come in from the command staff on how they want to be able to see their data, and allows you to be able to focus more on just providing that data for them, the data for them, and then they can go ahead and make their decisions based on that update to that information. So that's kind of an update for the uh, fire incident maps, unless I've forgotten here, Scott. That's pretty much a, a summary of it. No, that was good, Well, Thanks. Let me go ahead and grab control back. And All right. Share my screen. So let me just wrap, and then we can take some questions with um, – sorry. Everything um, we showed you guys today was doc is documented on the What's New page, and I know we've mentioned this a couple times, right? If you go to the solution site, actually, let me just start at the beginning. If you go to the solution site, and right on the main page there, there's a direct link to the What's New, and you can see the release notes for December. Um, as I mentioned, there were some other things we also shipped, um, just for the sake of time we didn't talk about today. Um, a new configuration of the crowdsource polling app to help with public comment process, and we retired a few of the older apps that were set up for that. Um, and so um, I would just encourage you guys to continue to keep an eye on this What's New page because it is a running list of everything new, enhanced, and even what sometimes we retire things with each subsequent release of the solution. Um, and you'll see more detailed release notes for each of these as you drill in deeper. So let, um, why don't we just take a break for a minute, Allison. Before we switch to uh, kind of where we're, where we're going in 2016, let's take some questions, if you don't mind. Um, and just kind of uh, you know give everyone a chance to ask questions on the stuff we shift in December. And I can hit a few of them if you want. Yeah, sure. Um, while we're answering these, if anybody has any other questions, I forgot to mention this in my intro, but on the left-hand side of your yeah. screen, you have a chat pod and a Q&A pod. You can submit any questions or comments to us through those windows. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions, Amy, you know, Amy let me take a couple of them on the elections. Yeah, sure. Amy had yeah, asked about updating the symbology on the map based on wait time. So one symbol for 0 to 10 minutes, another one for 11 to 20. Um, yep. How would you go about doing that? Yeah, you can absolutely do that. So one of the, uh, one of the changes we made for the wait times, uh, the, the polling place wait times, is we added an attribute to the polling place layer to track those wait times, and then you can update that in a real simple, straightforward way with collector. Um, so all you have to do to do that is then just update your polling place uh, service and symbolize it based on those wait times. And you could do like some kind of range, you know, that says everything between, you know, zero and five minutes is green and five. You guys decide what that threshold is, but you can certainly do that. Um, and then essentially those those updates to the symbology will be reflected, you know, in a, in a simple web map maybe on your clerk's site or in the actual polling place app. You guys decide kind of how you want to make that available, but you can absolutely do that. And Melinda had a question about the election polling places and those widgets being available in the uh, the core version of Web App Builder as opposed to just the developer version. Yeah, it's a great question. So we are, and we're going to mention this in a few minutes, also on our look forward in 2016, in the February, late February ArcGIS Online release, all of the widgets we've developed for the election solutions, and there'll be three of them. There's the the uh, district lookup widget that is used in the polling place app. There's the near me widget that's used in the um, early voting app. And there's the related table charts widget that is available in um, the election results application. And the flat theme will all be available in the core web app builder 
um, and you will not need the developer edition any longer to do that. And so that's absolutely uh, what we're working hard on right now, and we're actively, you know, we've got those in the development environment, and they will be available in the, in the late February. We'll just call it that, right, Allison, the late February release. Yeah, early early March. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, one thing you mentioned there was the flat theme. I think yep. we're changing the name of that, right? We are, yeah, we are. So, uh, it's not going to be the flat theme when it makes it into core. I think it's going to be plateau, I believe, is the name we're going with. Um, but yeah, essentially, it will be there, yes. Yep. Cool. We had to change the name because of some technical reasons, yep. <laughs> Uh, and the last question was from Andy about recording this. So yes, this meetup is being recorded. Um, I am not the typical host, and I don't know how to post the videos, so it may take an extra yeah. a day or two to get these up there. I will send out an email once they're all up. Yep. Uh, Matthew asked uh, for confirmation of where releases are published to. And that is the solution site, yes, solutions.arcgeos.com slash local-government. Yep. That's the same site that Scott was showing a minute ago. And that's all we've had so far. Okay, and we'll have some more time at the end. So um, so what we'd like to do now is kind of pivot a bit and start to look forward um, and kind of share with you guys the work we're doing. And, you know, we've got planned for early 2016, and as I mentioned, even thinking beyond the user conference this year. Um, so really, if I were to boil the work down that we're doing um, into some key focus areas, these are the ones that I would kind of share with you. Uh, we want to continue to drive out solution offerings uh, for our public works users. And we've got some very specific areas that we'll be working in there. Um, we have made, and you've probably noticed this the second half of last year, is that we've made a real concerted effort to enhance our planning and economic development solutions. And we're going to continue to do that. Walt's going to talk today about how we're really rethinking special event planning and taking a more holistic look at that. And then we're continuing to drive additional solution offerings into our, for our public safety community. And as I mentioned earlier, we're just at the start of a whole host of really great solutions for 3D that Gert's been working on. And you'll see those start to make their way into each of our subsequent releases. The other thing I'll mention is that um, we are, uh, you know, doing uh, some updates to the solution site. So you'll start to see, and I'll talk a little bit more about these, but you'll start to see us uh, improving the overall navigation and uh, trying to simplify ways for you to find content on the solution site. And as always, we are collaborating really closely with our state government solution team as well, too. And where there are areas of overlap, um, you know, we will be kind of delivering solutions not only for the local government customers, but also for state government customers as well, too. And the election solutions were a really good example of that. When we, when we shipped those late last year, we not only delivered configurations for cities and counties, but also for state agencies as well, too. So let's go ahead and just jump in and talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, and while we're doing our best, um, we're really balancing kind of that tightrope between sharing a lot of information with you, but also being conscious of the fact that we may slip a little bit on releases. And so while we're trying, while we're really dialing in uh, our work and we do have a good handle kind of on what we're planning to ship for each release, I just want to leave the kind of caveat that we may push things one release here or there, and we'll try to be real transparent about that uh, when we do. But we are feeling pretty good about what we are going to ship in February, so let's just dive in and talk about that. Um, so the first release we have this year will be the end of February, and it will coincide with the ArcGIS Online release. Um, and you'll see there's a couple areas we're focused on. One is um, an update to, when necessary, an update to the solution uh, components for 10.4. So you'll see new versions of the add-ins, some enhancements to existing applications, a few updates to the toolboxes, all um, to support 10.4. And you will also uh, have comfort to know that we've gone through every one of our solution offerings with 10.4 and tested it to ensure that it works. Um, and so we'll fully certify the solution on ArcGIS 10.4 and deliver that in late February. We talked about this already, um, but we're also actively working with the Web App Builder team to get the widgets and the theme that we developed for our election solutions um, delivered as part of the hosted Web App Builder, and that will happen. Um, 
We're also uh, delivering some enhancements to kind of our core configurable locator app, and that'll mean that uh, there's some new features and functions and some bug fixes in those configurations like shelter locator, park locator, and events calendar. Um, and then we're working on some new things, some enhancements, which we'll share with you today. Um, you guys have given us some really great feedback on the land use public notification app, and we've got some enhancements we're shipping there. And we've got some new work we're doing in public works for things like Vision Zero or uh, uh, Vision, Vision Zero initiatives across uh, cities and counties. So let me just wrap up, and maybe then we'll show you some stuff as well, too. We're also you know, just continuing that theme. Um, we've got a new configuration of one of our applications for real estate or residential comparable finders. Um, for those of you that are doing data aggregation, um, whether you're a regional agency or maybe a county uh, or maybe even a state, if you happen to be on the call today, we are working on some enhancements to our data aggregation tools. And I think you'll see some pretty interesting stuff there when we release that and some additional 3D scenes and updates that Allison's really working hard on for the web application templates. And so if I were to summarize what February really is, I mean, you could generalize it and say it's kind of a maintenance release where we're delivering a whole series of updates to support 10.4. Uh, we're taking the bugs and enhancements you guys provided us on several of the apps and incorporating those into a release, and yet at the same time shipping us a couple new things as well, too. Um, so let's take a look at a couple of those things. What I want to do is show you some of the work we've been doing uh, already um, on this residential comp finder and public notification. So let me jump out and do that. Um, so these are actual sneak peeks of the applications we're just wrapping up testing on right now. Um, and the first one I'm going to start with is the residential comp finder. Let me get rid of this so you guys don't see that. Um, but essentially, this is an application that your assessor's office or your auditor, or essentially folks that are responsible for managing assessed value and property information, uh, would publish. And essentially, what it allows citizens and other uh, interested parties to do is come in and find comparable residential properties. And so I can search for a simple address. You know, maybe I'm looking to buy a house in a community. I can find all the sales that have occurred within a mile or maybe two miles um, and get a list of those sales here and the basic information about those properties. But I can also refine those as well, too. And maybe um, I want to find properties that just sold you know, between $100,000 and $200,000. So I have the zeros there, one more zero. Um, and so I can further refine that list. And so essentially, um, this solution allows folks that are interested in residential property to come in and identify those key properties and get more detailed information about them. And when I click on an individual property, I can see detailed property characteristics. I can also see information that's being pulled from um, your geo-enrichment services that are part of your ArcGIS Online organization. So I can get detailed information about the neighborhood um, that's coming from that tapestry data. And I can either download that report or get more aggregate information about the community as a whole. And so much like the site selector application has been configured and set up for commercial and industrial properties, this is a very similar concept, uh, except for folks that are interested in purchasing residential property in the community. And as I mentioned, historically, the applications like this would be made available by the assessor or, or other folks in your organization who are responsible for property information and property value. So that's the residential comp finder. Um, the next one I want to show you actually is an enhancement to the current public notification application. And the one thing I'll mention is that what we're going to do in the February release is we're actually going to change the name of this application. Historically, we've called it land use public notification. And you know we started with that kind of key use cases, select a subject property, find all properties within so many feet, and then print mailing labels. Um, but really what we've done over time is enhance this. This application now allows you to maybe search for a school district and notify everyone within a school district, or you know, select a segment of a road and notify people on each side of that road that you may be you know, flushing a hydrant or doing a street project. Um, but what we've, heard you want, what, what we've heard from feedback is that what you guys really want to be able to do also is just go in and simply draw a polygon to identify the properties that you want to notify. Um, so we've added that functionality, right? So in the next release of public notification, you'll actually be able to go in and just uh, draw a simple polygon. And I'm just going to go ahead and say, give me all the property owners 
um, in that area and spit out for me standard Avery labels of those property owners. And so this, just, just like the other workflows this application supports, it'll go through and identify those properties and then ultimately spit out a really highly formatted uh, Avery label uh, format for you. And you could download the CSV as well, too. Um, so the real big enhancement there is obviously in addition to just doing you know, the traditional buffers or selecting properties within a given geography, you can now draw the geography that you want and, and do the, start, use that to start the notification process. So that's public notification and some of the enhancements we're, we're working on there. Um, let me continue on and then we take some questions near the end, Allison, as well, too. So that's the February release. Um, the next release after February then will be May, um, and it actually will be our kind of what we'll call the UC release. For those that aren't, haven't looked that far ahead, the user conference is actually in late June this year um, and not in July like it has been historically. Um, and so all, everything for us kind of slides forward three or four weeks. And so in late May, early June, we will have our user conference release. And what you'll see is that in this release, there will be a whole host of new content that we've started working on for you. Um, and that new content will be for public works organizations. Um, we're going to round out our capital project planning solutions and deliver some tracking, um, capital project tracking solutions. One of our more popular solution offerings, My Government Services, we're actually beginning to work on the next generation of that, of that solution. And it looks like it'll probably be a configuration of Web App Builder to support those key workflows. Um, Walt's been working on, uh, with other members of the team, on some new crime analysis tools. We'll talk today about special event planning. And uh, we've got a series of enhancements uh, for some of our planning solutions and starting to round out those 3D solutions to not only include 3D scenes, but beginning to you know, use, do 3D analysis uh, with your 3D data now. Um, you know, before we talk a little bit more about it, the other thing I'll mention is that uh, you know, we, we have a few key data management workflows we also need to finish. Uh, we've been cataloging and queuing up a set of enhancements to our address data management solution. And you'll see us uh, work on those. You know, think, we've been thinking about some things like, you know, more, uh, more productivity tools inside the desktop data management workflow, um, new uh, versions of the address crowdsourcing solution, and even a configuration of collector to help with field address verification. And so really rounding out the address data management workflows that we have. And then complementing that with a data management workflow for administrative boundaries. So, you know, cities and counties manage a whole plethora of administrative boundaries. They could be for things like voting or census geography. They could be, so they could be political boundaries. They could be administrative boundaries that you use for things like engineering districts um, or other resource allocations, or they could be legal boundaries um, like taxing districts and special assessment districts. And so we want to provide a real rich uh, data management workflow, much like we have for parcels and roads and addresses for those admin boundaries. Um, and then um, Allison's also been working on some enhancements to the crowdsource manager application, which you'll see coming in the May release. And finally, um, a whole set of solutions for blight remediation and blight prevention. Um, and so we'll talk um, what we'd like to do today. I mean, as I mentioned, these are really kind of, we're just now starting much of the development work. And so we don't have a lot of things to demo for you. But what we do have is uh, some richer stories um, for you around blight remediation and special event planning. So Walt, let me start with just blight remediation, and then I can turn it over to you to do the uh, special event planning stuff if you don't mind. All right, sounds good. Um, so let me, uh, uh, so what, one of the things we do when we start, oh, oops, let me start at the beginning, that would help. Um, one of the things we do whenever we start a new solution offering, or at least a collection of solution offerings, is to really try to identify clearly, um, you know, the the kind of key user community, user personas, and what problems we're helping uh, organizations solve. And last year, we had the opportunity to work with the city of New Orleans on a solution called Photo Survey. And we talked about that in some of our meetups last fall. Um, but essentially, what we saw is that you know through that work with New Orleans and some of the work I've done with the city of Detroit, is that there's a whole host of cities and counties, for that matter, across the country that are really trying to get their arms around the blight challenges in their community. And the, 
those blight challenges could be coming from a variety of, of different factors. They could have been the real estate crisis that hit areas of the country really hard. They could have been you know, some of the challenges we had in the Midwest and the Northeast with industrialization and population migrations. But ultimately, um, there's a lot of people that are really looking at how do they reinvent their downtowns and get rid of blight. Um, so, um, you know, what we've seen is that, you know, obviously urban communities are becoming destinations and real population destinations, again, for not only millennials, but a whole variety of other people that are looking to move downtown and really enjoy those vibrant urban uh, environments. And as I mentioned, the real estate crisis has distressed many residential properties and neighborhoods, and whether you're in a suburban community or you're in an urban community, the impacts of that can be seen. And what, as a result of of that, what we've seen is that many communities are developing real formal strategies to transform these distressed properties um, and revitalize these neighborhoods. And not only is there public dollars flowing into this, and just a few weeks ago there was an announcement that I think 60 or 70 million dollars of state funding is going to Baltimore. Um, there were several billion dollars as part of the hardest hit fund that was allocated by the federal government to cities all over the Midwest and Northeast. Um, there's also private dollars that are being invested through foundations to really revitalize these areas. And ultimately, um, you know, revitalizing these neighborhoods and, and uh, fighting blight increases the quality of life in these neighborhoods and stabilizes the tax base, which, al which ultimately right, begins to help with the delivery of services. So we found there's kind of three primary um, objectives that people need to accomplish. Um, to really fight blight, they need to understand, you know, what is the scope and whether you're a big city or small city, you're, you are tackling blight issues in your community. Um, and in some cases, the challenge becomes so large that they'll actually formalize a land bank, if you guys have heard of land banks, or uh, the treasurer's office or some other agency will actually acquire delinquent tax properties. And they'll have to either maintain those properties and improve them and then ultimately dispose of them and return them to productive use. And as I mentioned, it's you know, cities of all sizes. It's small cities like Redlands or the one I live in who are you know, handling blight complaints that are coming in through the citizens or even larger cities like Detroit and New Orleans and Philadelphia who've established formal land banks and uh, programs to go after these, these neighborhoods and revitalize them. City of Mobile, Alabama, did a really interesting thing where they, you know, equipped citizens in their community. They just basically used Instagram and specific hashtags to, to actually identify blight in the community, and they were using that to target their, their enforcement campaigns. And so everyone at some level, every city or county at some level, deals with blight and has code enforcement activities that are surrounding it. So what we're working on is a whole collection of solutions to really help communities uh, transform these blighted properties into community assets and vital neighborhoods. And essentially those solutions uh, will simplify the property condition inventory. And we've delivered many of these already. Things like photo survey and citizen problem reporter will be a key aspect of this. Um, but we'll round those solutions out to really help communities that are managing and marketing problem properties. Um, we'll add a set of simple information products to help with transparency and essentially allow you to report status of your uh, blight reduction activities or maybe demolition activities in your community. And the one thing it will be is flexible so you guys can kind of pick and choose which solutions are important to you and you can configure them to meet specific needs in your organization. And so you don't have to use all of them. You can just select the ones that are most appropriate for your organization and deploy them as you see fit. And so what that will look like essentially is a collection of you know, solutions and even simple maps that you author from your ArcGIS online or your portal for ArcGIS organization. Um, and they'll be organized around kind of three key workflows. How do you identify blight concerns in your community or where you may have at-risk properties in your community? Things like utility shutoffs and late tax payments um, are kind of leading indicators into blight concerns in the community. Um, if you do need to acquire property, you know, how do you then market those properties? Much like we saw um, with the site selector application for commercial properties, land banks and, and treasurers who manage property also want to do the same kind of thing. Um, you can see how the public notification app can be used to notify property owners when you may be doing demolitions in the neighborhood and, and when those demolitions are going to occur, perhaps. Um, and then ultimately, how do you aggregate and share that information with citizens and provide some transparent representations of that data as well, too. Um, and so you'll see that as well going forward. 
Um, so right now, you know, what we're doing is really kind of vetting all of these ideas and, you know, the prototypes that we're working on with a set of stakeholders. If you guys, if anyone on, you know, the meetup today is interested, just let us know and we'd be glad to work with you as well, too. Um, we'll be developing some prototypes for the new solutions that we are going to ship um, in January of this year and February, actually January is about over, February of this year, really, um, and we've started working on those already, and then we'll refine those in March and April and then ship the new offerings in our May release. And so that's a quick overview of some of the, kind of the, the larger work we're doing on Blight. What I'll do now is turn it over to Walt, and then we can actually take some questions, too. So let's see, Walt, go ahead, you just grab it. Okay, good. Stop sharing uh, my screen. Share my screen here. Yep. Uh, so as far as special events is concerned, as you can see on the screen here, uh, this is just a, a few, uh, but basically their special events are something that occurs in most communities all over the world, really, uh, and they've become more and more popular, increasingly popular in the last decade or two. And as you can see here, there are some that may happen in your, some of the communities that you folks are in, uh, and there are various sizes and different kinds of events and so on. And we think it's important to be able to support these events that are occurring uh, for a couple of reasons. Is one is they are spatially uh, uh, distributed, as you can see some through the list end. Um, they are uh, important to each one of the communities that you guys work in. So one of the things that uh, we noticed about them is that they are typically a community function or gathering which is intended to promote an activity or cause within that particular community. Uh, one of the things that we've been noticing as we've been meeting with some of the user organizations is they, they tend to pull communities together and sometimes even give the community an, identify, an identity. Um, they do require a lot of coordination. One of the things that Scott and I have been learning as we've been traveling around and visiting with these different uh, agencies and cities around the country is that it requires uh, a lot of coordination between the different agencies such as planning, parks and rec, public works, police, fire, EMS, health, and so on. Um, because they all are getting involved in it when it's uh, a, a major event or a bigger event. Sometimes they're sponsored by a profit, for-profit or a non-profit. There's now becoming quite a few uh, event companies around the country uh, that are now you can hire. Uh, your community can hire them to coordinate that whole event, and then some of that money may go on to some, 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 some sort of a um, cause, or it may be uh, just distributed amongst the participants in the community. They generate quite a bit of revenue, and that's been the biggest reason for the increase in them, is that participants from all over the country, in some cases all over the world, will come. Uh, and, and if they're a major sporting event, like a, uh, a participant event, like a marathon or something like that, they generate revenue from that as well. So we see quite a few increases in the number, both the number and the scale of these events in local communities. And subsequently, they have a contribution to the larger, larger area economy. So maybe the city around that area or the, the, or the uh, counties around that area. So therefore, uh, they become more important to communities. What we've also noticed, and that is there is a workflow that starts way back. One of the things we learned is it it's, it's actually starts way before the planning. And uh, this is kind of just an overview of what we see in it. Uh, it starts with the permit application, uh, which includes things like the located information uh, about the about the event and so on, the site plan. Uh, that goes into a review process where there are multiple different agencies that have to look at that permit application and review it and approve it or deny it, depending on what they need to do. Uh, and so they're going to update information, and a lot of that is locational information. Uh, then it goes into the planning process once it's been approved, and there, there could be some things like a traffic management plan, medical plan, it could be other things, a uh, uh, security plan and so on that would be put together based on that approved plan. And, and then once the event happens, it goes into the operation mode where they need to monitor the activities, inspect different venues, sometimes they're food venues or uh, music stages, or perhaps it's scattered across a large area. Uh, there might be some fire EMS response teams that have been pre-assigned uh, locations according to the incident action plan, as well as the law enforcement agency. So all that stuff goes on during the event that needs to be monitored. And that feeds from the planning, the plans that have been put together based on that permit application. And then it goes into the public information. We also need to share some information to the public either before or during the event, in some cases after the event. Uh, participants need to know where they need to line up, where they need to drop their bags, where they need to be picked up, things like that. Spectators need to know where they can park, where the grandstands are going to be, things like that. 
Uh, very often there needs to be um, some kind of a VIP area for elected officials where they can be present and, you know, uh, do uh, presentations from. And then the media. Sometimes they have to stage cameras uh, different places along a, a path, such as the Ironman or something like that, where they can have access to a special thing. So there is a variety of different needs, and it typically goes this, this type of a workflow. What we're planning to do in it is provide a new solution that really will be a collection of maps and apps that support that entire process from the permit application to review planning operations and then also uh, give you tools that will allow you to share information with the, with the public. And so with that, we want to be able to accomplish a few things. Like one, we want to simplify the whole permit application process and review process. Quite often we see that it comes in through a napkin or sometimes it'll come in through a PDF or some other form. And one of the biggest challenges for the GIS analyst is to be able to take in that input uh, that may be in a DWG file or something else, something like that, and convert it to something that can be useful and then be used uh, really as a digital asset as it goes throughout that process. So we want to lose, you want, we want to use that locational information and organize the event around that locational information. We want to be, allow the users to be able to share that information and improve the communication. As I said before, it requires a lot of communication between the different agencies. And so one of the things that uh, is important that we realize uh, for our users is to be able to allow them to be able to share that information and improve that information back and forth, especially about security things. We want to also be able to provide information about past events, how many people participated, where did things happen. It's very useful for after action reports for security reasons, but it's also useful for planning for the next year's annual event. And they do become annual um, if successful, so that's an important aspect of it. Um, one of the things we want to be able to do is figure out how we can support real-time information that's being gathered in from the, during the event. Maybe it's weather. It might be some other kind of incidents that are coming in. So ways that we can support how that information uh, is coming into the uh, event monitor. And then also another a aspect of it is to be able to be flexible so it can be configured. We know that sometimes you get small events at small uh, organizations where it has to be very simple. And other times, it's very big, very complex at major cities. Um, and there may be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are attending. So it requires a lot more planning and a lot more uh, efficiency. So those are some of the objectives that we have for the, for the offering. Uh, this kind of gives you a, kind of a visual conception of what we are thinking about. We start off on the left. Then with the permit application, uh, there might be a way for a simple way for just to collect some basic information about what the event is, when it's going to be, where it's going to be, maybe uh, attach a PDF if you already have one of that event, or be able to just simple information. So for those of organizations that don't have a way to be able to get that information in from, from a sponsor or somebody else, we provide them a way to do that. Um, another step in the process is for the permit uh, people, public works, uh, public safety, and so on be able to review that permit application, cycle it through the, through the process, provide that information on to other people, and quite often it's dependent on each other. Uh, so the traffic people, they might be dependent on uh, some other information that's coming in from another agency, for example. And then it goes into the whole planning process. And this includes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of agencies have to create an incident action plan for law enforcement and fire if they are doing the fight command. So they have to build an incident action plan. And uh, we want to be able to support some of the forms in that incident action plan. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the incident updates be able to allow users to configure ways that they can receive updates uh, during the incident and monitor that information out to a dashboard or something like that. And then share that information out to the public and perhaps even get information from the public. So there's quite a variety. So what you can expect to see when we do release it is probably a collection of different apps that you would be able to leverage either independently or as a whole uh, to manage the whole event. So it's quite an expansion from the current event. If you have looked out there for our special event planning template, it currently is a desktop-based um, uh, tool or solution that allows you to do planning, the planning portion of it only. And you can expect that that will grow quite a bit with a variety of different tools, again, that you could leverage independently or as a whole. So that's kind of a summary of what we're planning to do for a special event. As Scott mentioned, we are just working on it. We've been meeting with several agencies around the country, communities, gathering some information from them, and we will be proceeding on with this 
uh, towards that main release. So that's pretty much a summary of it. Scott, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. And share. Back to you. Thanks, Walt. Okay, so let me just wrap up with um, some things we're thinking about after the May release, and then um, we can open it up for questions again, Allison. So as I said, you know, right now we, you can see we have some pretty clear marching orders or plans for the February and May release, and essentially that work reflects some of the things that we shared with you on our backlog last year, actually, and, you know, we're now beginning to work on it. So as we're delivering, you know, these existing solutions, uh, are these solutions we have planned for February and May? We're also, you know, kind of keeping a backlog of things we're thinking about for the second half of of this year. And you know, these are ideas that people have come to us with, or things that we, you know, as we look out across the local government space, that we know, um, you know, we get to provide value in. And so, um, you know, in public safety, you know, there's some areas that we need to do after we get the special event planning work done to help with pre-incident planning for both law and fire. Um, continuing to expand some of our work and planning. You know, we've done a ton of work for underground utilities, water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure, but we haven't done anything for private well and septic systems, which make up, you know, everyone else, essentially, who isn't on public water or public sewer. Um, and sometimes that's a planning function, sometimes it's an environmental health function, um, but ultimately there is a process, you know, whereby a city or county goes out and identifies where those wells are, what the isolation distance is between a well and a septic and maybe a structure and what kind of septic system is put in through a permit process. Uh, some things we've heard from animal control, we haven't done anything really in public or environmental health, and that's our area I think we could work in. Um, we continue to grow a backlog of things um, for public works agencies. Some of you have come to us and said, Scott, we, you know, do you have anything for cemeteries or cemetery management or maybe vector control? Uh, we've seen some cities, like it with the big snowstorm this week, where they wanted people to go out and essentially a, adopt the hydrants uh, to clean out that hydrant. Or maybe um, New Orleans came to us with an idea about adopting a stormwater inlet or a catch basin um, and having people help with kind of the maintenance of that infrastructure. Um, and then, you know, I guess I'll close with we also have some apps that, quite honestly, are getting a little long in the tooth, and we need to think about what the next generation of those solutions look like. And in particular, one that we're thinking about is the tax parcel viewer, um, kind of that primary public access application for, for uh, land records information, and an application that we started many, many years ago with the city of Boston called Executive Dashboard. Um, so we'll share, as Allison said, we'll share this video. We'll share the, so we can share the slides as well, too. And I'll probably ask Heather to put a poll up on the meetup site as well, too, and I really would encourage you guys to give us your feedback on this backlog for next year, what's important to you, and, and uh, what would you guys find valuable, and where do, you, you know, where do you think we should begin to focus our efforts, and ultimately, would you be worth, uh, willing to work with us on that? And so let me close, and then we'll take some questions, because um, I saw some queuing up while Walt was talking, Allison. Um, you know, there, there, you guys do have some homework assignments. Um, you know, we really want to, if you haven't done it already, download, you know, one or more of the solution offerings and really take it for a test drive in your organization and, and give us feedback on that. How can we grow and evolve these solutions so everyone can benefit from them? Um, and ultimately, your participation in these meetups and the feedback you give us on the solutions will drive the work we're doing in 2016. Um, so the, the kind of the more you put into it, I, I always like to say it's kind of a participatory sport. The more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. Um, and thanks for all your feedback last year, and I hopefully you're starting to see that come to life in some of the applications we showed you today, and, you know, we'll just continue to do that as we go forward. Um, so I know we're getting right up against 3 o'clock, or at least 3 o'clock my time on the East Coast. Um, you know, we'd be glad to, though, answer some questions, and I was making notes, Allison, um, as we went um, as well, too. So I guess we can open it up for questions now, and we'll see what else comes in. Yeah, sure. There is quite a pile of them here, um, and this is being recorded. So if you need to leave, but you your question hasn't been answered yet, um, mm -hmm. check out the recording once it's posted, and we'll make sure we go through them all. So the first one here is actually back to elections. I missed this one. Um, in the early okay. voting and election polling places solutions, is it possible to disable directions? Absolutely. Yep. And when you okay. configure the widget, you can choose not to enable directions. Okay. Um, Allison was wondering. Uh, if we could mark or denote when an application is WCAG compliant. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're working closely with the core ArcGIS web teams. 
um, on that compliance. And as we start, you know, as ArcGIS starts to become more compliant, we'll start to incorporate that as well too. And we will identify that when we are. Uh, John asked, I think you may have just answered this, but he was wondering if there were any plans for upgrading the tax parcel viewer in the near future. So I think you said late 2016 we're thinking about it? Yeah, absolutely. And John, Chris, I know, wants to connect with you on that, so I'll make sure that um, he, he reaches out to you because we were just talking about that the other day. We'd love to work with you on it. Charlene was wondering what support local government has for the new NG911 GIS data requirements. Yeah, we've been keeping a a close eye on that. I mean, I've lost a little bit of track of it the tail end of last year. My understanding is that they have not been released yet. When they are released, we will look at those guidelines and incorporate them as, as it makes sense. Kyle is wondering about the new public notification or book public notification app. Is it going to need base maps to be published separately, or will it consume web maps that have been created in ArcGIS online? So it, it will not use web maps, but you can use the basic ArcGIS Online base maps, or you can use the base maps from ArcGIS Online in the application. Um, this generation of the app will not use web maps, though. It will just use service references. OK. Uh, and Matt had a question on the name. Um, it's going from land use public notification to just public notification, correct? That is correct, Elson. Yep. So we're just dropping the land use. Yep, to reflect um, the more Matt, general use of the app, right? Yeah, yeah. Matt was wondering mm -hmm. if there were any changes coming to Collector for ArcGIS. Do you know where he could go to get that information? I would go to the help with subtypes. Yeah, <laughs> yep. I saw that <laughs> one. Um, yeah, uh, I would go to the Collector for ArcGIS site, and I think there's a GeoNet forum, or there's certainly ideas. On something like that, you know, which is a challenge with subtypes for sure, um, I would also contact Esri Support Services directly. But they, they, have a, they always have a backlog for collector just like we do, and they're working it. I don't know what the specifics are, though. Yeah. Um, Steve was wondering when he can expect local gov tasks in ArcGIS Pro. Good question. So. Um, the 3D scenes, that basic scene that we talked about today, actually is an ArcGIS Pro project that Gertz developed to help you guys. So we're, we are, you know, as it makes sense, we are starting to leverage ArcGIS Pro and in particular tasks as well too. Um, and you'll see that if you grab the 3D scenes, um, that that is actually a Pro project with tasks that walk you through that uh, workflow to publish your content. And we'll leverage that when we can. I, you know, in the near future, I don't expect to deliver any of the desktop data management workflows, um, primarily because there isn't any attribute assistant functionality yet in Pro. And so when the attribute assistant functionality starts to come, of, come alive, then we'll begin to take advantage of it, and you'll start to see us port the desktop data management workflows over to Pro tasks and workflows and projects. John is looking for more resources and tools for loading data from other schemas to the local gov model um, and for exporting out to custom schemas for other applications uh, as repeatable tasks, things that can be scheduled. Yeah, so, so we just did that for the election. Yep, yeah, that's a really good point, Allison, right? We did a lot. In cases where, um, you know, we're ingesting content, into ArcGIS, we typically do provide those publishing scripts. Like Walt mentioned today on the fire incident maps, that uses a set of tools to take data from your CAD and record system and load it into ArcGIS. We did the same thing for election results. Um, you know, there is a set of topics or there's some references on the info model page for tools that will help you with that. These Gazinta, and we've done, I think, a meetup on this before, the data movement tools that Steve Grizzé has been working on is a great set of tools for that. Um, yeah, and then I guess, you know, we'd have to get into the specifics on what you'd want to publish to. Um, there's also some scripts we provide for the tax parcel editing workflow that allows you to push content out into simple features that can be used in the other apps. Um, so we'd, I guess we'd have to get into the specifics and maybe shoot me an email or post something on the Meetup site and we can talk more about it. It is definitely something that we have on our radar, though, whenever we're working with other data formats. Right. Um, 
Adam had a specific question, but I think that this is a good general one as well. How you mentioned people getting involved in testing and, and how they should get in contact with us for things like that. What's the best way of contacting us? Adam specifically is looking to get in on the signaled intersection solution. Yeah, meetup site. Just go okay. through the meetup site directly and you can post on there and just kind of identify or you know you can hit us up directly via email too. Yeah, you can message us individually through that meetup site as well. Yep. Yep, exactly. Okay. Uh, sorry, I've got two piles going here. I just got to find with the top okay. of the other one. Um, Matthew had a question. What feeds the residential comp finder? Meaning, what data do you need to have in order to allow sales to be viewed? Is it something that they need to develop, or is it something that can be consumed from Esri? So no, it's not. A, it's not a um, standard layer that comes from Esri. It, it is a, a layer that your assessor would produce of qualified sales. So as they're setting the assessment val, you know, assessed values for a given assessment role, um, they will look at a sales in the community. Those are tied, you know, to parcels, and then um, just like some of the other layers that we have in the land records workflows, you, it actually is the same sales layer that's in the, um, you know, value dashboard and others. So it's a in all likelihood, it's probably going to be an export from your CAMA system that then gets used to create features in ArcGIS. Matthew was also looking um, to know if we had a map of the formal land banks. I know I've yeah, seen Chris throw one up, but is that available publicly? Um, you can get it on a site called Center for Community Progress. They're a group that um, actually uh, works with land banks all across the country. So if you were to Google Center for Community Progress, you'll see those guys are doing a lot of work in that space, specifically with land banks. And could you quickly just go to the Meetup site, just so people can sure. see where that is? It's uh, meetup.com, and if you search for ArcGIS for local government, you'll be able to find us. That's where this video will be posted. We've had a question on that. Yeah, and, and if you haven't been to the Meetup site before, you can just get it from the solution site too, right? So you can get it here. And go from there. And we typically will post the videos on this video recording page. OK. Uh, Ronald was wondering, um, he's not currently using local government. Uh, is ArcGIS Online all you need in order to get these local government solutions? Yeah, so it depends. Well, to download them, you, you just need a ArcGIS or a, you know a username, and you can download anything from the solution site. When you get, you know, when you decide, you know, you, I would start with um, essentially, you know, by perusing the solution site and looking specifically for the solutions that are of interest to you. So if I'm, you know, looking at something for public work, um, you know, I can just continue to drill through the content here and kind of align this content with the business challenges I'm trying to solve. When I get to the right solution, in this case, it's you know road network management. Um, it'll tell me exactly what pieces of ArcGIS I need, um, and so it'll tell you here, typically under one of these, you know, in this case, I need desktop, and that's it. Um, and what kind of experience and what versions of ArcGIS it's supported on. If I go to some of the other solutions, like there's one related to that for road maintenance agreements. In this case, this is a simple web map. Um, and using ArcGIS Online, it'll tell you that as well too. So it it clearly articulates on the solution site, you know, kind of what pieces of ArcGIS you need um, to configure the solution in your organization. Okay, I see one more question from Kyle. Uh, if I have missed your question, please resend it. There is a long list of things that have been sent in here, uh, and I am trying to get to everybody's. Kyle was wondering. Um, how to update from one version of the info model to another if you're working with solutions that are based on that. You mentioned the Gizinta tools. I yeah, there's the also, um, yeah, it's a good point, uh, Allison. So there's also another tool that we provide called the Schema Migration Wizard, which will help you go from one version to another. Um, and ultimately, the project essentially will, you know, you can, um, you can essentially you know, look at your existing schema and the changes you made, compare it to the new version we shipped, and create a new target schema. 
And then you can use focus into tools to do the data loading or maybe just append data in. So depending on kind of how you've configured um, the solution to meet specific needs in your organization, that may or may not be a lot of work. Um, but this schema migration wizard is obviously, you know, something that will be valuable to you. And I would not look at it like a compliance or I need to keep up kind of thing. I would really be keeping a close eye on the release notes um, for the info model and the new solutions we're adding. And you can be very strategic about, you know, how you want to incorporate um, how you want to incorporate those updates and when you want to incorporate those updates. Because we do document, you know, with every release of the info model, um, detailed release notes that tell you exactly what we changed and when we changed it. And so you can see here's the stuff that, you know, we did in December, the minor updates we made to add wait time for polling place, for example. And if I keep going back through subsequent releases, you can get a sense for, um, you know, kind of what, sometimes they're major releases, sometimes they're not. It just depends on kind of the content we're working on at that time. Hey, Allison, one of the questions I saw, I think, when I was looking at it, is that someone was wondering, will there be attribute assistant updates with the address enhancements that we're making? Yeah, um, Allison just resent that one. Yeah, and the answer is maybe. We don't know yet. Um, it, there may be. Uh, there won't be updates to the tool, probably, um, but there may be updates to the rules that we write to support some of these new workflows. We're just not sure yet. I think we've caught up with the pile. Nobody, <laughs> nobody knew is typing. <laughs> um, again, if you think of something after the meetup that you um, want to ask or that you more information like on anything, you can always comment on the meetups page and we'll get back to you from there. You can send us messages through the meetups page um, and then you can reach us through all of the usual Esri, channel, Esri channels, you can post ideas on the ideas site. Um, we're all regularly on GeoNet, um, troubleshooting and, and keeping an eye on what's going on there. And um, yeah, so I guess that's it for today's meetup. Um, as I've mentioned several times, the recording for this will get posted in the next couple days on the meetup site, uh, which Scott showed earlier. The next meetup is coming on. Uh, it's going to be on the February. election map. It'll be a, it'll be a, a deep dive into the the new election solutions that Scott showed briefly today, and that's going to be on Wednesday, February twenty fourth, at the same time as this meetup. So whatever that fell at in your uh, in your time zone, it'll it's eleven p.m. Pacific uh, or eleven a.m. Pacific. Sorry. So Allison, one that, of the other questions. Hey, Allison, yeah. one of the other questions that I saw, um, Melinda, I think asking questions about. Um, so the way to disable routing in the election widget is to disable it on the web map. So if you disable the routing on, as one of the properties in the web map, then it will not show up in that widget and it will not show up in your app. So that's how you do it. OK. <laughs> sure. That seems no problem. Like it's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, we'll see you guys all in about a month. Thanks for joining yep. us today. Thanks, all. Have a great day.